from the time I was, you know, a small child, music was the thing. I was always trying to play whatever was around. I mean, if there was no instruments, I'd play on pots and pans. My dad had a guitar around the house, so I played that. There was a piano, later on drums and bass, but music is just the one thing that really touches me in that way. Growing up around parents that were just into everything. My mother was a theater actress. My father was, uh, was a journalist for NBC and he was a producer of music, jazz. So I grew up seeing everybody. My, my first concert in New York City, I, I, I was probably six, was the Jackson 5 at Madison Square Garden, um, James Brown at the Apollo, then going to see all these rock shows. I mean, because uh, Sid Bernstein was a, good, was a good friend. He was like a godfather to me. So we'd go to all the rock shows. And I started out playing guitar, you know, when I was a kid in New York, and piano, because we had a little upright piano in the apartment. And then when I got to LA, I started playing drums. I always wanted to be a drummer, but living in a tiny apartment in New York, that wasn't going to happen. My mom, we couldn't have drums. And so I started playing drums in junior high school. And then after that, I started playing bass. In New York, it was mostly about soul, R&B, jazz, funk. Then I moved to LA when I was 11 and ended up in Santa Monica in 1975, so it was the whole Dogtown Z-Boy scene. That's where I learned about Led Zeppelin and Jimi Hendrix and Cream and The Who and, and, and Kiss. I wanted to be in a band. I wanted to be the guitar player, the drummer, the bass player. I had no intentions on being the singer and being in the front. I used to be the guy you could rent to like go make your demos. I'd play all the instruments and you know learn your songs and I'd, I'd play them and produce them. Um, I used to, you know, make pocket money doing that. I just always liked to play different instruments. Yeah. And it was never a plan on, on the first record to start playing all the instruments myself. I couldn't afford to, pl to pay people to play. And the people that I could afford didn't play the way I want, that I felt they should. And so then my engineer was just like, dude, I've heard you play all the instruments. Just do it yourself. And I was like, do it myself. That's no fun. I want people around, you know? But. In, in the great tradition of people like Stevie Wonder and Todd Rundgren and Paul McCartney and Prince and, you know, who have done that, I was like, okay, cool. You know, I love those records. I mean, let me, let me try and play it myself. I have all this music inside of me. So when I made my first record, I couldn't stick to one thing because I just love music. So one minute's more rock, one minute's a little more funky, a little more R&B, a little more blues, a little more gospel, a little more whatever. Um, and, and, and it continues today that way. Let Love Rule just came to me. I was trying to write and the things I was trying to write, I thought, I thought they were mediocre. And so it's when I stopped trying that it happened. I just got quiet and my life was going in a certain way. And I was with Lisa Bonet at the time and we were having this amazing relationship and living this this incredible sort of hippie lifestyle that we were living in the in the late 80s and we were in love and and um, this record just came like it just I just heard it and I was like there it is When you look at the best songwriters, whether it be Paul McCartney or Elton John or whomever, or Lionel Richie, anybody that just is a songwriter, and you go to those shows and you're just like, my God, the arsenal of, of songs that are, you know, are the fabric of our lives. You know, it's, it's amazing. I want you to want me. I'm going crazy knowing he will be your lover tonight. And when he comes, I'll let you go. I'll just pretend as you walk out the door. Oh, no. I got a bucket full of money. And a bucket full.
were getting to the end of a session and we came up with this thing, put it down in five minutes, went home with this track with no words, no melody. I just, I played it over and over and over the entire night on my boom box at home. It's no vocal and no melody, no lyric. That night I write it, I go back in the next morning, I sing the thing. I had no idea what that was gonna be. I think the only time I ever knew I had a hit was when I wrote again for the greatest hits. Nancy Berry, who was running the label, she called me, she says, we're gonna do a greatest hits album. First of all, I thought it was greatest hits. She's like, no, it's time for a greatest hits. She says, we need, we need one song and we want it to be a mid-tempo ballad. That's what we, so I'd never done that thing before where somebody said, this is what we want and you got to deliver it on this thing, never. But I had this challenge and I had a month to do it and came up with that song, crafted it, worked on it. I mean, really had a direction for that. And when it was done, I was like, okay, that, that's a hit. That's the only time I knew. The only other time I knew I had a hit song was when I gave Justify My Love to Madonna. I called her and I said, I have a number one song for you. I had just come off the road from the Let Love Rule tour. I was nobody. I was the kid, new kid on the block. But that drum sound was a big thing. That was like the center of the track. Wanting. Needing. Waiting. For you to justify my love. My I got a call from Guy Osiri, who uh, was dealing with the, the spy who shagged me, soundtrack and movie, and, and he says, we want you to cut American Woman for the movie. And I thought, what am I gonna do with that? It's like, it's, it's perfect, it's amazing. I said, okay, let me try and mess with it. And so I, I got into it and I listened to it. Huge song, Grammy, like I was like, it's amazing. Different sounds for me tell different stories and have different moods. When I put those records on, I can smell, feel, taste everything about my life at that time. 